The spirit of truth calls us to what matters. She is the go-between, the connective force that moves from one creature to the next. She invites us to know our place in all things. Every inhale, every exhale belongs to everyone and to everything. She is the constant communication that speaks to the soul of all that exists, all that grows, all that dies. She gives across systemic separation, across species. There is no barrier she cannot overcome. She surpasses human understanding and speaks the truth in ways everyone can understand. She knows our longings, understands our groans, and with merely a sigh, releases a prayer too deep for words. To the dismembered, she brings community. To the walking dead, she brings new life. To the suffering, she makes use of our troubled past. She fuels us, places a fire upon us, gifts us with her inclusive language of clarity and truth that we might begin to understand the hope of God that she keeps in motion. And the importance of working together as one to dream wholeness dreams into reality. Good morning, Cornerstone. Welcome to our new friend. And there are a few, few, four beautiful little people in the back room. They are gorgeous and full of life. As, as I talk about the spirit today, I was thinking as I was making my way around the back to come in from behind the curtain, um, we're going to see that the spirit animates life. And when I think of animated life, I think of kids. I think of children. Sometimes they can be overly animated. <laughs> oh, but they are full of life. Hello to everyone on Zoom, those who are watching. Thanks for being with us today. It's so good to see you and have you with us to celebrate Lee's birthday. And... Um, and many more, and to be a, to be here on on the day of Pentecost, we'll be talking about that today. As we start, we're going to go to the beginning. Now, Scott, I don't have this on the slide, so just hold here for now. But we go back to the beginning because today is Pentecost and I think most people when they think of Pentecost they think of the coming of the Holy Spirit and when we think of the Spirit we we have a decent idea of who God the Father is and God the Son Jesus but when it comes to the Spirit it's it's a it's a little for some it can be a little more nebulous a little more unfamiliar but to talk about the Spirit, we have to go to the beginning. It says in Genesis 1, 1, Yes, the Spirit shows up on the very first page of our Bibles. In the very first verse. So I take it back. The second verse. The second verse. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. Some of the Hebrew words are tohu and bohu, right? Darkness and chaos, formless, void, without form. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then what happened? God spoke and said, let there be light. So we have the Spirit in the beginning, the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, ready and waiting to create. And we see the creation account 
in the beginning, in the book of Genesis. The Spirit of God. Now the word there in Hebrew for spirit is ruach. Can you see that with me? At the end, you've got to have a little guttural, little... I was listening to some other sermons and some other lectures, and one of them said, you have to have a little spittle coming out of your mouth in order for you to be saying it right. Now, we won't go that far today, but we do have tissues if you have spit coming out. <laughs> but but say, say it with me, ruach. 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 That's Hebrew, the Hebrew word that is translated to our English, spirit. But that's not the only word that ruach in Hebrew is used for. In English, we have a lot of different words for different things. But in Hebrew, one Hebrew word can mean a whole list of what we would use different words for in English. It can mean breath, wind, ruach. Spirit, spirit, breath, life, wind. I'll show you an example of that here in just a little bit. But I wanted to go to the beginning because the spirit was there. Father, son, and spirit were there. And so that gives us a little bit of an anchoring, a little bit of a foothold, a, a placeholder when we get to Acts 2, talking about Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit. But before we get to Acts 2, I want to read in John. Because in Acts 2, you can go to the next slide. In Acts 2, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Here in Acts 2, the Spirit comes. It says suddenly, like out of nowhere. Were the disciples, were those who were gathered in the room, in the place where they were, were they ready for this? Were they expecting this? Well, you would think yes, because we're going to read here in John that Jesus over and over and over again said, I'm going to send the Spirit. And he said, wait in Jerusalem until the power, until the Spirit is sent to you. Now, I don't think he gave them, now put this on your calendar, it's going to be at 12 o'clock, or actually this probably 9 o'clock in the morning on this day of Pentecost, 50th day after the Passover, the Spirit's going to come. He just said, wait. So hopefully they were anticipating something, but I don't know if they <laughs> were really ready for this. So here's Jesus, because if we just jump right into Acts, and it says what it says, and we'll read it in a minute, that the Holy Spirit came over them, and not just you know, pixie dusk and a, a nice incense or mist. It came down quite suddenly and um, in a dramatic way. But Jesus told them that he would send the Spirit. It says this in John 14 verses 15 through 18, not John 14, 1518. There's supposed to be a dash there. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. And I, I like how it says another advocate, because Jesus, in one sense, is referencing himself as an advocate. But I'm going to send you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. The spirit will make himself at home in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So Jesus is getting them ready. This is in the, the discourse in the upper room at the Last Supper, the Passover, here in John 14. John 13 through 17 is Jesus getting his disciples ready for what is to come and what is to come. His arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, and Praise be to God, his resurrection and ascension. 
He's getting them ready, and he's going to say, I have to go back to the Father, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. And it's so weird if you read it, he, he's saying, I'm going, but I'm coming. I'm going, but I'm not going to leave you. I'm going, but I will come to you. Jesus, make up your mind. I'm sure the disciples were saying. But the advocate, some of your texts may say comforter. It comes from the same Greek word paraclete, which means advocate, a go-between, somebody who stands on your side, somebody who advocates for you, a comforter. But the advocate, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace. I give you. So in one sense, the spirit, the advocate, the comforter is a, not just a representation of, but a giver of peace. He's leaving the spirit. He's leaving peace. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. In John 15, verse 26, it says, when the advocate comes, when the comforter comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me to us and through us. And you must also testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Next slide. Jesus isn't done yet. In the next chapter in John 16, verse 15 through 7, Jesus says, Now I am going to him who sent me. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going back to the Father. But none of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. What things? Well, one, namely, that I'm going. Jesus is saying, I won't be around in the way that I am in the flesh with you like I have been. But he also told them, he said, I'm going to be leaving you. And they've persecuted me. If they persecute me, it says in John 15, 20 through 21, they will persecute you also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. And then earlier in this chapter 16, they will put you out of the synagogue. That is, to, to put a Jewish person out of the synagogue, that's where they go to worship God, to hear from the Torah and that's not a good thing to be kicked out of church. <laughs> they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. So the disciples are probably freaking out about this. They're full of grief. Jesus is talking about leaving us. And when he leaves us, they're going to People are going to come after us and persecute us and kill us. And so I can imagine this was all up in their head. And so they didn't even think, Jesus, where are you going? They were filled with grief. Jesus continues, but very truly I tell you, it is good, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, the comforter, the spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You see, Jesus in his human form was very localized wasn't he? At this time, he could only be at one, in one place at one time. Even after his resurrection, he was only in one place at one time. Now, he could get from one place to another place at one time quite swiftly. <laughs> he could walk through doors. You remember locked doors when they were in the upper room? But still having a physical body in one sense, he was localized. But through the power of the Spirit, Jesus is not localized anymore. He's in all of us, all over the place. It is good that I go. It is good that I go. I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I say 
and why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So whatever is the Father's, is the Son's, is the Spirit's, and the Spirit teaches us, shares that with us, gives it to us, that grace, that peace, that mercy, that forgiveness, the wisdom, truth, is all passed on to us from the Father, the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have this setup of Jesus telling his disciples, the Spirit is going to come. Now, we see in the Old Testament, the Spirit was alive and well in various places. But this was a fresh, a new coming. Um, Again, not just to be localized, but to fall upon all those who believe. And it was the day of Pentecost when the Spirit came. Let's go to Acts 2. Acts 2, verses 1 through 21, our text for today. And so when the day of Pentecost came, stop, Pentecost, when it came, was this just, oh, let's celebrate Pentecost today. Today's a good day to celebrate Pentecost. No, it was a specific day, a specific time where they were all gathered together. And we're going to see it wasn't just the disciples or the 120 who were following Jesus who were gathered in one place. They they were there, most likely in a room, but there were people from all over the place in Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. Let's talk a little bit about Pentecost before we go on. You can go ahead and leave the slide here, um, Scott. Pentecost. What is Pentecost? This term derived from the Greek Pentecoste means 50th, 50th. Pentecost means 50th. And it comes from the fact that this festival is celebrated on the 50th day after Passover. Pentecost was kind of a, it's a Greek term. They used to call it in the Old Testament because Pentecost was never used as a description of this festival in the Old Testament, is called the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks. And so the Feast of Weeks was celebrated 50 days on the 50th day after Passover. And it it was one of three Jewish pilgrimage festivals. You know what a pilgrimage is? People who live all over the place, pilgrimage, journey, take a trip, to one localized place. People have pilgrimages. Sometimes they'll make a pilgrimage once a year to a specific cemetery. Family will decide to come together and visit um, the grave of one of their loved ones. Other religions have different pilgrimages to certain holy sites. And there were three festivals that were commanded in the Old Testament for people to go to Jerusalem. It's one of the three Jewish pilgrimage festivals in which individuals were to appear before the Lord with gifts and offerings. This was one of those times. And so we're going to see that people were coming from all over the place to celebrate this festival, to give an offering. It celebrated the the Feast of Weeks, And it's called Feast of Weeks because it's seven weeks plus one day, (laughs) plus one day. Because seven weeks is how many days? 49. But it was the 50th day after Passover. Seven weeks plus one day. It celebrated the end of the barley harvest and the beginning of the wheat harvest. And it's appropriate that this event that was going that this event that was going to propel the gospel to the ends of the earth took place at a time when people from the ends of the earth were in Jerusalem celebrating this festival. Let's go ahead and continue. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Again, the disciples were, some say most likely in that same upper room where they celebrated the Passover. 
I guess they got it as an Airbnb for a while because they had it for the Passover. They were in um, that upper room most likely when um, after Jesus uh, was resurrected and he visited them a, a number of times. And, and here, most likely, not that it really matters what room they were in, they're, they're here again together because Jesus told them to wait for the Spirit to come. And a wind filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. That's a lot of representation, isn't it? People from all over the place were there. Jews and converts to Judaism who were coming to celebrate the Feast of Weeks. Sometimes it's called the Feast of First Fruits. We call it Pentecost. They, they were there. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Quite a miracle to come from who knows how far away having a language, going to a international site. Maybe it was the first time to Jerusalem where they were pretty sure their language would not be spoken and certainly not the language of the culture where they were going. And all of a sudden they hear their native tongue, their native language. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Right. If you lived in Galilee, you, you grew up speaking the language of people from Galilee. Not only that, Galileans were typically not highly or super educated individuals. In other words, they wouldn't know multiple languages. Agrarian people, fishermen around the Sea of Galilee then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Now, can I get somebody to read the next verse? I'm just kidding. <laughs> because we look at those. <laughs> we look at those and, okay, where do I start? These are, these are different words for us, aren't they? Where they're, they're people from particular places. Parthians, Medes. Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Me Mesopotamia. See, even I, I even practiced. I even practiced. No, I didn't practice because I've read this a lot, but I thought, I'm going to get up there and just read this. Ooh, silky. Well, I've already unsilked it, didn't I? <laughs> Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews who had left Jerusalem to go to other places and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. Cretans. Have you ever heard that word before? Sometimes people are called a Cretan and it's not a compliment. <laughs> it's, it's a bit derogatory to be called a Cretan uncouth, uneducated, maybe a little disgusting, but we have Cretans here and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, our own languages. Amazed and perplexed, they ask to one another, what does this mean? A very fair question, isn't it? What does this mean? What is going on? Some had an explanation for it. Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had too much wine at certain past times in my life. I couldn't speak another language. <laughs> so I, I, I've always struggled with how, how does this explain 
the 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 disciples speaking in other languages or other people understanding what they're saying in their own language being a result of being drunk or having too much wine. I don't get it, but that's what it says here. Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Or maybe they're making fun of them. Oh, you just think you're hearing your own language because you're loopy and you've been drinking. And we're going to find out from Peter that this was 9 o'clock in the morning and not too many people have wine for breakfast. Next slide. We're going to look at this before we continue on in our text to give you an idea of where all those unusual words and places that I mentioned that's in the text of Acts 2, where they might be. I'm not going to point them all out, but this is, this is a couple of decades after the, the, the writing of the book of Acts. This is 117 AD, the height of the Roman Empire, and this is all of the conquered territory of the Roman Empire at the time in 117 AD. Quite a large place. And all of the, the people groups, all of the places mentioned in Acts 2, fell under this Roman Empire oppression and conquering. These are all conquered peoples except for maybe Rome itself. They didn't conquer themselves, but they Rome from Italy spread out and conquered all of these people. And Jerusalem is one itty little bitty bitty place. Can you, can you get up, can you point out Jerusalem, David, for everybody? I don't want to leave the camera. You, you see the delta right there? It's just going to be right up, uh, yeah, right there. That's, yeah, you can see the Dead Sea, and the Sea of Galilee right there. It's just a little bitty, bitty place. But people from all over were coming to Jerusalem for this festival. And they're from all over the place. I'm going to read just a little bit from an article from Diana Butler Bass um, to give us a little bit of context. And we'll, we'll bring it all together here um, in just a little bit. All of these people were, as the text says, devout Jews gathering in Jerusalem for a major, major, a major pilgrimage festival of weeks called Shavuot. Is that how you say it, Lee? Shavuot. S H A V. Yeah, Shavuot. That's how you would say it in in Hebrew. Well, that's not how Hebrews would say it in, in Hebrew. <laughs> That's how I say it in Hebrew, <laughs> quite poorly, I might add. Shavuot, or the Festival of Weeks. And Shavuot is one of the three Jewish pilgrim festivals prescribed in the Hebrew Bible, occurring 50 days or on the 50th day after Passover. And as I said before, it celebrates both the wheat harvest and it was not only the celebration of the wheat harvest, it was a time when they celebrated the giving of the Torah, the law. Some of us just know it as the Ten Commandments, the two tablets. It was more than just the two tablets, the Ten Commandments. It was the entire law and the covenant given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And Pentecost was a time to celebrate that. So they were celebrating wheat and the word, the, this provision of God for their harvest. And they gave an offering, but they also remembered and celebrated the giving of the Torah to Moses. And in Jesus' day, and here in Acts 2, pilgrims went to the temple to offer the first fruits of the new crop and to sacrifice any sacrifice of bread made from the newly harvested wheat. So they brought two loaves of bread to offer. And they had to make the bread. They couldn't just go to the corner market and pick up a loaf of wonder, right? <laughs> do they even make wonder bread anymore? No. Uh, yep, I guess they do. Anyway... Two loaves of bread. And this crowd is maybe more interesting than immediately appears because they came from all over the Middle Eastern world. Parthians, Medes, Elamites were from kingdoms and empires located in present day Iran. So if you can, if, if I hear Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, I don't know where that is, but I know where Iran is. And that is where they were 
uh, from. Not from Iran, before Iran was Iran. Mesopotamia is roughly northern Iraq. Judea now includes parts of Israel and the West Bank. Cappadocia, Pontus, Phrygia, and Pamphylia now make up Turkey. So they came from all the way from Turkey. They came from that area all the way for this festival. Cyrene was a Greek colony in North Africa. And of course, some of the names are more familiar to us. Egypt, Libya, Crete, and Arabia. People coming from all over to be together in Jerusalem. When Acts 2 Pentecost occurred, most of these kingdoms had been conquered by Rome. See? Everything in red is the Roman Empire, conquered, oppressed, to become a part of the empire, whether they wanted to be or not. They are now a part of the Roman Empire. Many of the groups were under direct Roman authority. Long before their conquering, though, most of them had been significant powers in their own right before being conquered. Empires to themselves and often at war with each other. So you have all these people who in years past were most likely at war with each other. Because what do empires do? They grow their empire. And how do you grow your empire? You colonize other lands, other people groups. And they're here together in Jerusalem. These colonized states had formerly been colonizers themselves. And within their boundaries, there were numerous foreigners, mostly people they'd conquered in the former imperial days, including Jews, who had become an outcast diaspora or scattered, spread people. And the Jews were typically at the bottom of the colonized hierarchies wherever they lived. This is a day that a lot of people celebrate the birth of the church. This is, this is the, the, the nucleus of it. The, the starting point, if you will. Diana Butler Bass says, but this isn't just the birthday of the church. There's a lot more going on here. It's more than just a nice day to be celebrated with balloons and cake in Fellowship Hall. It's a clarion call for empires to repent, for the colonized to rise up, and for both to forge a new community in the fire and the wind of the Spirit. And this is what happens in Jerusalem, that these people from all over the place somehow, whose forefathers were against each other and at war with each other, come together and form a new community by the power of the Holy Spirit. The empire might have killed Jesus, but the struggle continued. And on this day, 3,000 rose up in his place. It's not in our text, but it was on the trivia in our countdown. How many people were baptized as a result of this weird, amazing, miraculous, violent sounding wind and then the tongues of flames alighting on the heads of the disciples and this incredible speaking and understanding of their own languages. 3,000, 3,000 of them after hearing Peter, and we'll see what Peter says here in here in just a minute. After Peter gave his sermon, they, the, the crowd said, this is, what does this mean? This is incredible. What, what do we now do? And we won't have time to read all of Peter's sermon in Acts 2, but I would encourage you to do that. 
because he preached the gospel and people were convicted. It says that they were convicted and it overcame them that this one who was crucified, this Jesus, is the Savior, the Lord, and the Messiah. What now must we do? And of course, Peter said, repent, change your mind, change your thinking about God and who you are in light of him and be baptized. And there were about 3,000 baptized that day. On this day, 3,000 rose up in his place. Where Rome had one rebellious Jew, Jesus, they now had thousands. Diana Butler Bass takes a certain tact on this story. And we could be here for weeks and weeks and weeks, probably seven weeks worth of sermons. <laughs> and on the 50th day, we would come to a conclusion. Because to unpack Pentecost, let alone unpacking the Spirit, that's just, you can't do that in one sermon. Although some of you may be thinking, he's trying to do it in one sermon. <laughs> she takes a bit of a, of a political tact. And this was, there, there is so much in the New Testament and Jesus' parables and the way that he talked and the way that he upended uh, tradition in a, in a way. It, it spoke against empire. It spoke against oppression. And when you speak against empire, when you speak against the government, what is that? That's political. She says, this is political. And it must have threatened any Roman occupiers who witnessed it. It, it, and you can imagine like in any movie maybe that you've seen where you have um, various oppressed peoples, if they come together and start talking, the, the empire, the, the, the oppressors get worried because you know that they're probably hatching a plot to overthrow the empire, the ruler, the ruling class, whatever it is. And to see these people from all over the place that the Romans had conquered, coming together in one sense of one accord, having same heart and mind, what shall we do? What do we do? And then baptized. That must have been freaking out the Roman occupiers at the time. This wasn't an uprising to take the throne back. Or to start a riot. Peter said that this was an uprising of their dreams. An uprising of power. But not power of oppression. Not power of overthrowing. But the power of the Spirit. Together, these provincial pilgrims formed a community that stood in direct opposition to Roman identity, Roman social practices, and Roman economics. You see at the end of Acts 2 how the people came together and the way they lived. And that was totally, not so much in opposition, but so unlike Roman culture. The Roman identity was Caesar. This group's new identity is Jesus. And as they got together, the apostles' teaching. Roman social practices were all over the place and probably quite crude and vulgar at times. But the social practice of this new group of people is the breaking of bread. And you break bread with family. You break bread with those who take care of you and who are, you are going to take care of. It stood against Roman economics. Everyone for themselves. 
these new believers shared all things in common. Rome had built a world of war and woe for the vast majority of the people under its boots. Pentecost birthed a community of God's peace, constituted on an ancient day of gratitude. That's what this was, a festival to give thanks, to give an offering. The people who gathered in Jerusalem that morning were not free individuals. They were underneath the Roman Empire. They were not there with protections of religious liberty. They made this journey in the shadow of the crucifixion. Where one of their own, a popular yet controversial rabbi, had been executed by the overlords. And the rumors swirled of a missing body, strange appearances. Remember, this was 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, 50 plus days after his crucifixion. Now, in today's news cycle, something happens, and then a few hours later, blip, it falls off the radar. Certainly after a few days, something else in our new cycle is just trying to feed us more and more and more and more and more and more. But you can imagine back in this day, word may have just reached some of these far-flung areas, that there was a crucifixion of a Jewish rabbi. Some people would have called him a revolutionary or a rebel, a troublemaker, a criminal. And they're coming back to this place, as Diana writes, in the shadow of the crucifixion. The news cycle was a lot longer back in those days. And yet they still went. They still went to Jerusalem after all that had happened. They'd made a difficult journey from long distances in dangerous times to be at this festival. And so knowing who was there and why they were there, the real miracle of Pentecost comes into focus. All these people were victims, demeaned, enslaved, and brutalized by Rome. But they stopped being afraid. They received power from the Spirit. Those diverse peoples who had been at war for centuries, whose ancestors had tried to destroy one another, suddenly realized they weren't enemies at all. They finally heard one another. The spirit broke through, and they discovered their own story of a world destined to be shaken by the justice of God. In their minds, Caesar was no longer in control of their lives. Here was an advocate for them. A fresh power, a different power than Caesar. The spirit was unleashed, poured out on all flesh, men and women alike. And despite enslavement, these were God's dreamers and prophets of the great and glorious day. Dreamers and prophets of the great and glorious day. Let's go on to the next slide and finish our text. Because the people ask, what does this mean? And Peter got up and told them. And we're only going to read the first little section of Peter's sermon. Again, I encourage you to read the rest of the sermon that Peter gave Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So Peter is saying this is a fulfillment of what Joel the prophet was talking about. In the last days, God says... I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And these aren't just any dreams, right? We all dream dreams. 
Maybe we'll see a vision, but this is beyond just seeing something in your mind's eye and having a little sweet, cuddly little dream. This is something much bigger than that. It's, it's visions of God's future. It's dreams of hope and justice and righteousness, wholeness, even on my servants, both men and women. So the Spirit is not biased, shall I say? Doesn't play favorites. We've already had men and women, sons and daughters, old women, old men, now slaves, servants, both men and women. Even on my servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The Spirit, God is doing something new through the Spirit. As we saw in Genesis, the Spirit is a life giver. The Spirit is the breath of God. The Spirit is powerful like the wind. And it's interesting, when we talk about the Spirit animating life, I want to read just a a little short passage from Ezekiel 37. Because there are three different words that is translated from the word ruach, where we get Spirit. It says this in Ezekiel 37. I don't have this on the slide either, Scott, so you can keep it here on the hold slide. This is from um, the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones from Ezekiel, if you're familiar with that. If not, Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was on me. This is Ezekiel. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. This is a vision given to Ezekiel about how God will raise up his people again. It was full of bones, and he led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were dry. And he asked, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones, right? This this disordered darkness death, dry bones, no life in them, no breath in them, no ruach in them. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry, if there was any question. Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you. I will make ruach enter you. And what is ruach also translated into? Spirit. The animating life in love of God. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. The Spirit gives life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath, ruach, spirit, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no Ruach in them. There was no breath in them. Just the muscles, the skin, the bones, maybe even the organs, but not the life yet. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Ruach. Prophesy, son of man, and say it. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath. Ruach. From the four winds. 
That, went, that word winds there is from the Hebrew ruach. Come breath, come ruach from the four ruachs. <laughs> and ruach into the, the slain. This word of life. This word of wholeness. This word of power. Come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me in breath, ruach, entered them. They came to life and stood up to their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up for them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord, and I will open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and have done it, declares the Lord. So there's a lot going on here at Pentecost when we talk about the Spirit, Ruach. In the Greek, they use the word pneuma, pneuma. It's where we get words like pneumatic, air-driven, right? We are air-driven. <laughs> we, we give, we are, we've received animated life breath right if we have no more breath we're what not alive <laughs> we are dead the spirit gives us life the breath of god the life of god the power of god the spirit in the past specifically in the old testament had mostly been localized Right? The Spirit symbolized by fire on Mount Sinai. Especially the people down at the bottom waiting for Moses to return. That is up there, not down here. It's localized on Mount Sinai at the giving of the law. The Spirit, the presence of God is symbolized by the pillar of fire and cloud later to take up residence in the tabernacle. It's right there. It's localized. And it was the presence of God in the temple, the Shekinah glory. The presence of God was in the temple. That's why the people came from all over the place to Jerusalem, to the temple. The presence of God, localized. But now, with the powerful and fresh coming of the Spirit at Pentecost, resting on them as flames of fire, being filled with the Spirit, and then the subsequent baptism of and receiving of the gift of the Spirit, the 3,000, it would no longer be localized. So these people who, in a word, said yes to Jesus... <laughs> And were baptized. Remember, they were from all over the place. They went back home. It says they were baptized and filled with the Spirit. The Spirit is no longer localized. In one sense, it's localized in us, but it's not the only place, is it? The power and the Spirit of God is everywhere. These pilgrims would go back home and with them, the truth and grace and the gift of the gospel. The Spirit would do its work in these people all over the world. We see here in Jerusalem in the book of Acts on Pentecost, the Spirit breaks down walls, dissolves divides, welcomes diversity, And it falls on us as well. We are recipients 
of the same Spirit that's talked about in Acts 2. We're recipients. We are the home, a dwelling place, a resting place for the Spirit. The Spirit that animates life, giving breath to all living things, giving us breath, giving us life, giving us strength and power when we think we have none, reminding us of the truth of Jesus and what He has spoken, comforting us, advocating for us. The Spirit continues to hover over the darkness and the chaos. There is darkness and chaos in the world, isn't there? But the Spirit in each of us brings goodness and wholeness and order to life. And in the last days, whenever those days are, when Jesus returns, the Spirit will do its work yet again. The Spirit does its work in us every day of our lives. It hovers over our darkness and chaos, wanting us to receive it, and let the Spirit make its home in us. But there will be a day when there won't be darkness and chaos. And the living breath of the Spirit will be in all things. The Spirit is in us. Next slide, Scott. The Spirit is in us. May we receive her. May we accept the comfort, advocacy, truth-telling, and peace that she promises. May we listen to the constant communication that she speaks. And may we let the Spirit fuel us and place a fire upon us. May we cling to the hope of God that she keeps in motion and work with her together as one to dream wholeness dreams into reality. And so maybe instead of saying, Spirit, come, because the Spirit has come, may we open our eyes to the Spirit and receive her. In Jesus' name.